Oh, we're flashing. I don't know. It's, it's flashing. I, th I think I'm supposed to wait until it turns green. S synchronized. Our watches are not synchronized because this clock has said 3 o'clock for like. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Brandon. Uh, this is how to build a business on FOSS. So... Uh, don't do it. That's it. That's all I got. Right. Thanks for coming. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Obviously, uh, I've got uh, what 49 more minutes to convince you not to do it. Uh, no, just uh, so. But in all seriousness, building a business is hard. Right. That's that's the hard part. Is the business part. Um, the software, the you know open source component of it, all the technology, is the easy part. Um, so, we'll get to that. Uh, so, who you are, if you're in this room, maybe. Uh, so, maybe you're thinking of starting a business and you want to incorporate open source software into your business. Maybe you already have a business and you are saying, hey, I'd like to really use more open source or switch some applications I have over, over, open to, over to open source. Uh, Maybe you're just another, you know, you're just a tech person and you're saying, hey, I know some entrepreneurs, I know some small business owners, I want to help them add open source to the business. Hopefully this can uh, help in that, that uh, regard as well. Or maybe you're simply curious or there wasn't another interesting talk right now, so thank you for being here. So, um, just gonna, I'm not going to like, this slide may be a little bit uh, too much, but I just wanted to, to point this out. So another hard aspect of business is communication, right? And I know there were some days uh, in, earlier in my career where I got really hung up on the language, right? And like, I get, you know, it's got to be free and libre and all this, you know, and, but you'll hear me throughout the, this presentation, I'm only going to say open source, right? That's what regular people understand. And if you're in the business world, you need to talk what business people, regular people understand. Um, and I have a, a real world example of this, right? Uh, one of my mentors uh, in, in the entrepreneurship space, Great guy. Uh, he was really excited talking to me about how they're using Godot, you know, for doing a new application, uh, a new game that they're designing. And he loves open source. And we had a couple of conversations about different pieces of software he was using. I suggested some things for him. He's, you know, awesome, right? And so, you know, it was like one week. And then the next week, I'm talking to him, and I sent him some of my early notes for this presentation and some of the other stuff I've been doing. And he said, "Oh, yeah, well, that was cool. Cool, but like, I didn't understand FOSS. I had to go look up what what was FOSS, right? Because Right, that's what the language uh, self uses for everything. So that's what I, you know, put in my presentation. I said, he said, you know, I get it once I looked it up, but you know, this is a guy who's using open source every day, you know, uh, understands the open source ethos, wants to continue to, to support open source, but doesn't know some of the more nuanced language. So, uh, you know, just just know your audience, right? Who you're talking to, uh, if you're trying to do business built around open source, and you're you're sort of selling the idea along with it. So why open source to begin with, right? I'm sure we all have our reasons in here. If you're talking in the business world, you're gonna, a lot of times you can get them on cost, right? Um, and I don't like to lead with free here, right? Um, I don't say free software uh, for the reason, because people confuse free, right, as in liberty freedoms, with free as in, you know, no cost. Um, I like to actually lead with like low cost or lower cost uh, solutions uh, to set the expectation, maybe, uh, you can convince people, say, like, look, this is, we're going to do a 90% discount, right, off of uh, one of the, the big players, one of the big pieces of software you have, um, because we're going to use this open source, which is uh, lower cost, and we're going to give 10% back to the project. This is the, one of those pieces where I'm hoping to convince people uh, of some ways of doing a little more open source sustainability. Um, so, 
So that's one of the, the bits. Um, so another one, right, another place you can convince business people, right, regular people, is to avoid vendor lock-in. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have worked in IT or currently work in IT, and maybe you've been in a vendor lock-in situation before uh, or, you know, had the rug pulled up from under you. Uh, I have a story uh, about this one. Uh, so uh, VPN solution that I will not name, uh, you know, used at the, the previous company I worked at, and it was one of those things where, you know, it was licensed and there was some cost to it. Uh, and it was, you know, at the time we said, okay, it's reasonable. Uh, I actually, you know, it was one of those things I inherited. And it was a, um, you know, an, an annual fee based on the number of concurrent users, basically, you had for the system. Um, and then, you know, after some years or, or months of using it, all of a sudden they come to us and, ah, oh, your, your contract, we see your contract's up for renewal. And, uh, but we're not really, re we're not renewing under the, the same old plan. We're, we have a new model. We have a Monthly subscription model. I bet you've never heard that one before, right? <laughs> so uh, and so, month, so we're going to move to monthly subscription. By the way, you know when you calculate it out, it's it's going to cost you oh at least twice as much as it did before. Uh, and you know, oh don't worry, don't worry. We'll give you a break, you know, for the first year. So it'll be it's only a little bit more than you're paying before. You know, it's maybe like a 10% increase. But I'm going. Well, what happens in year two? And they go, they look at me like. You know, you're gonna you'd probably pay the whole price is what what that meant to me, right? And so, those are those situations where you know maybe that was sort of lucky, right? We had we had a year, right, and we had uh, the ability to say, okay, we can eat this cost if we wanted to. Um, but you know, we ended up moving off that solution because it that that was sort of it was too much cost for for the value we were getting out of it. And then it starts, you know, you start to think about questions of well, what about what if they had changed it to a monthly license and I have to pay for every single user that's registered in the system, not just concurrent users? You know, there's, there's a lot of changes they can make. And that's, the, you know, we all know that, right? That's, that's where you are uh, when you're at the mercy uh, of, of a vendor like that. With an open source solution, you know, they, you know, even, even if it's a hosted solution that you're paying for, they change the terms on you, you can go ahead, take, you know, keep using the version you're using or, uh, fork it, you know, whatever you need to do to keep it running. And you can at least, at least buy yourself some more uh, lead time there. Um, so, right, so if you're, you're here at, at self, right, some of the ethics or freedom reasons might be some more reasons to use open source. Um, I like this phrase here, uh, maximum technical liberty. Uh, Noah Chalaya, uh, he, he's here. Uh, he, I believe he coined that term, or at least he uses it sometimes. Uh, so, I, so I sort of uh, borrowed that from him. Uh, any, anybody else here? Anybody? You're, you're looking a little bored. So anybody, anybody want to tell me why you use open source? What, what, what fuels you? All right, wait here. I, re I remember we're supposed to use a microphone for this one too. <laughs> Did you fix that, or because we yeah. couldn't get the sound working? Did you put it closer to your? Yeah, yeah. Well, no. It okay. <laughs> Many eyes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So I'm not gonna turn this into a giant Q and A right now, but. They they couldn't hear me because it was like more buzzy than clear and we're improvising. Okay, just talk into the mics and it'll record it, right? So anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna continue on the presentation. So so what do you actually uh, need to run a business on open source, right? And this is the slide going like all the crap you already use, right? It's it's the basic stuff. So I don't want to say this is everything, right? I don't even want to say it's most, but probably is right from the day to day it's it's the it's your daily desktop applications the stuff you're using every day already to do to do your home stuff every, the stuff you're doing every day already to um you know if you're you know working for someone else right it, it's like it's the usual suspects right so you've got your linux desktop pick your distribution of choice i didn't go you know crazy with the, the representation here but uh you know I, it doesn't matter right firefox or another browser of choice right an open source uh, browser uh, if you're running everything on open source 
LibreOffice, right? Going to probably be like a shining star staple of, of business software, right? You need your spreadsheets. You need to have uh, text, uh, you know, rich text documents. You need uh, to make presentations, uh, you know, and there's a lot of other stuff you can do. Uh, LibreOffice says draw if you need to do some simple diagrams and those sorts of things. So there's a lot you can do with, with just the stuff that you probably already have, right? If you're running Linux desktop on your laptop right now, um, so uh, then there's you know some other more specialized stuff that's also desktop software, um, and uh, I have a couple of image uh, imaging software uh, applications up here, right? So everybody probably knows GIMP. Uh, I'm not a GIMP expert, right? I'm, I'm a business guy. I'm a tech guy. I can't you know do much with graphics, but you need to be able to do the basic things. Like and maybe you're not using something as, as full feature as GIMP. You might just want to do uh, I don't know whatever image you know viewer editors built into to your distribution of choice. But you got to do simple things like crop uh, you know crop images and rotate images and stuff like that. So maybe resize something. Um, and then Inkscape is another great one if you ever have to do anything with vector graphics or uh, you know, making an icon for something. Again, not really a graphics guy, but I managed to do some stuff. I managed to, to turn a uh, raster image into into a, a vector graphic, uh, you know, from a simple, simple thing uh, to make a logo. I was pretty proud of myself there. Um, but these are, these are great tools um, that are available right on any Linux desktop and other operating systems as well if you choose to go that route. Um, so, and, and there's also uh, more specialized stuff, right? But I'm not gonna really get, get too far into that. Uh, you also need the web, right? And by that, I mean, like, you need to access the web, but you're also probably going to need a web presence if you're building a business on open source. Um, so we have great tools for that, right? This is, this is one of the other places open source shines. We have WordPress uh, is, is, like, probably the most popular CMS out there right now. There's a gajillion other, uh, like, CMSs, Drupal and things like that. I'm personally using Hugo, uh, which is a static site generator, uh, which is pretty cool if you're more, you know, come from a developer side of things or just, you know, command line. Uh, I like the workflow where you can, you know, just, uh, well, I was trying to start a blog at one point, right, and it's, it was just really nice to, um, you know, type a markdown you know, push it up to a Git repo, and boom, it's it's published to my website. And it was a lot better workflow for people, uh, perhaps others in this room who who have that kind of mindset. Um, whereas, you know, WordPress is more for regular users. You get your WYSIWYG editor. Uh, I found it to be a little more challenging to to use on a day to day basis. Um, so you're also going to need some place to host all this stuff, right? Self-hosting is great if you want to go that route. Uh, you might want to use something like Webmin, you know, if you're going to kind of roll your own self-hosted thing. You can obviously host, you know, I mean, it depends on your skill level, right? I come from a sys administration background, amongst other things, right? So, yeah, I could roll my own web server, and yeah, I could even do the, the proxies in front of you, whatever I needed to do. Um, but I've decided... Honestly, that shared hosting is usually the better bang for the buck. Um, do you know, do you want, you have to, these are decisions you have to make, right? Do you want to manage all of this yourself, right? Or do you want to have a little bit of help with some of that management? Um, so you can go, right, get your own VPS, whether it's, you know, literally self-hosted at home or, or do something on a VPS. You can get a lot of value for money if you start putting a lot of stuff in, uh, you know, one server. But you got a lot of eggs in one basket. Shared hosting, a lot of that management, security updates, those sorts of things, at least to the, to the operating system part. Um, going to be handled by the hosting provider. Um, so shared hosting was, I'm surprised at the amount you can actually run on, sh on decent shared hosting these days, um, which is, you know, uh, useful. So uh, alongside my Hugo website, uh, I'm also running a, a product called, uh, application called Modic, uh, which is like probably lesser known because I had never heard of it before. But it is um, like email marketing uh, software uh, you know, because at some point you're going to need to actually reach out to your customers. Um, what I like about it a lot is it does a lot of um, sort of tracking that you're going to need to run a business without, like, being too creepy. I think you can integrate it with, like, Google Analytics and that kind of thing. Um, I choose not to do that. But it gives you the information you need about your customers, um, lets you capture that um, and get s some of those statistics you would want. Um, and also... Uh, really uh, has worked well for me with Hugo because Hugo, right, having a static site, you don't get things like forms like you would with WordPress and that sort of thing. You have to sort of bolt everything on like that. Um, and Modic is a tool that lets you, like, build a form within that and then, you know, just sort of embed that or, or, or place that, you know, within uh, your website. So, uh, good there. So, uh, along with the web, I've got this little frowny face next to an email icon down here. Um, I, I would say, uh, and you've probably heard this before, uh, like don't self-host your email. It's, it's rough. Um, <laughs> so 
Um, I think that's one of the pieces that, un that unfortunately I'm going to go like, well, hopefully they're running, you know, uh, open source technology in the back end, but we'll never know. But really email is, is you've got your, th your three huge players and then you've got a handful of, of smaller players underneath that. Um, you know, a lot of people probably using Proton Mail, those kinds of things, which is, which is great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to give, give a, a solid, like, probably don't want to do this unless you're, unless like that's what you've done for your career is like, roll email servers and, and host email, then maybe you've got a shot at it. But uh, even for a, a veteran systems administrator, I'm going like, mm, no, I think, I think I'll leave this one to, to the pros. Um, so yeah, so beyond, beyond that, you are also gonna need some sort of business basics, right? I'm gonna call them, uh, right? So your like online office suite um, kind, of, kind of tools, uh, shared file, file sharing, um, meeting software, Calendaring software. Um, I didn't put the icon up here, but I think Nextcloud is probably a great tool to handle most of that. Um, it's a. It's just. I'm really impressed with what it can do. I hear there's some performance issues sometimes, but it's one of those places where you can get so much value for what you put into it. Right. Even if you pay uh, for hosting. Right. This is. I think they've done a really great model. Uh, for their company, right? They, they've got this open source tool. It's totally open source. You can go and you can grab the code. You can grab the installer. They've got like maybe too many different ways to install it, <laughs> uh, but you can install it on your own infrastructure, install it on a VPS, do it all yourself, and and that's great. And it's probably what I'll eventually end up doing. Um, but you can also go and they have like a uh, th th basically they they partner with uh, other companies um, where they that you can either um, pay them uh, direct. I, I don't know if it's directly, but set up a, a relationship with one of their partners to have it um, built for you. And there are places out there where you can literally just, you know, it's either like a one-click WordPress install or, or, you know, hosted WordPress, right? Google it and, and they have, uh, I think, like two providers, none in the U.S. that are in their, like, simple, I don't know, they call it a simple, it's another S, simple install, but it's, but it's an S word <laughs> that, uh, that you use to, to uh, install WordPress, which, or not WordPress, um, Nextcloud, which is really... Um, can take care of a lot of um, those pieces for you. Um, another rock star in this uh, arena, I would say, for the calendaring, not, not now I'm not talking like your personal calendar, but uh, booking meetings, uh, like Calendly, a Calendly alternative, if you're familiar with that, uh, it's cal.com. Uh, it's it's a really great uh, solution. They also are fully open source. You can totally self-host it if you want to, um, but there's basically no reason to because they they've got a, a free service um, for just about everybody. It does all of the stuff I, that I would use for ca Calendly for, um, and, and I've never you know the, the paid version of Calendly, but it's the fr free version of uh, Cal.com, and then. Uh, so um, their, their business model is they want to charge like the top 1%. Like, so they're really high end and uh, enterprise customers and that sort of thing so that you can, you know, so that that's how they're, they're uh, allowing everybody else to use it for free. I also have things up here like uh, Bitwarden, right? You're going to want a password manager, manager. What about it? It's on. Yeah. Where? Okay. Somehow turning that down. Anyway, it's on. I don't. I don't know. All right, I'll, I'll. I'll eat the mic. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, so you probably want something like a password manager, right? Everybody's going to want that. Um, so, uh, Bitwarden's, you know, another one of those examples of something that you could either self-host. It's open source software, or you can uh, host, it, or, or you can pay them to take care of it, right? Those. Those are some of the great solutions that you have the option, right, to either. Do it all yourself or have it done professionally for you, but it's open source, so you get to have the options to take your data and, uh, and the infrastructure either way. Um, I also put Sweet CRM up here. It's something that a lot of people don't think about when you're like, like you know, and, and as far as technology goes, I never thought, like, oh, let me, let me get into CRM software. Um, and so if you've ever heard of Salesforce HubSpot, right, this is, that's, those are, you know, commercial CRMs, uh, something you're going to need pretty probably want pretty early on in, in starting a business because, uh, you know, business uh, doesn't make any money if you don't have customers and you need to be able to uh, keep track of those customers. Uh, I believe you can also integrate that with uh, Modic uh, and those sorts of things. And then I have the and others because there's a million. I mean, we could go hours long on all of the different pieces of software. Yeah, you can see this.
Just talk, okay. It's, do you, can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> so I've got too, th too many things to juggle, but we'll, we'll deal. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll have to talk quietly into the microphone. I can't get too excited. Okay, so ZFS is um, you know a great solution. Uh, it's a great file system that can incorporate a lot of these uh, the backup and and uh, rollback recovery uh, strategies right into it. Um, try this one. Goodness. Testing. Does that does that one work? All right. Sorry. That's no, okay. I win the award for most interrupted presentation today. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, how are we now? Yeah? yeah. Good, good ish? Oh, just don't talk too loud. Okay. All right, I'll just speak very quietly for me and it'll be okay. Wait, where am I getting that feedback from, though? All right. Um, I also use. Uh, Sync thing for I, I wouldn't call it you know backups, uh, but certainly part of that strategy of uh, you know it's obviously it's the sync tool. I, I really think this is worse with the mic, but okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think uh, it's it's a really good tool f um, to use in uh, addition to your backup strategy, right? So I use it. Right, I have a home server. Uh, haven't done anything, any of any of the stuff that I'm talking about, I haven't done any of it for my business yet, of course, you know, talk about it, don't actually do it, no, I'm, do the opposite of that. Um, but no, the, uh, so I use sync thing to, I have, you know, my servers, my source of truth, uh, sync it to my phone, uh, select, select files to my phone uh, so that I have stuff with me all the time, uh, certain notes and those sorts of things, uh, knowledge management system I use, um, and then there's, uh, I sync it to my laptop, uh, and that, you know, a lot of the stuff is two-way sync, um, but you can do really cool stuff with sync thing um, by setting it to a one-way sync, like just to the server, um, to use as, like I said, in conjunction with your backup software um, to make sure that things are getting backed up. A good example, I use, you know, not really a business case, but I use it to shuttle the pictures from my phone back to my home server. Um, and then I do have backup software running there, right? Um, I don't really love it, so I'm not going to you know, say what it is. But you know, it's one of those like it has an open client, but it doesn't have an open backend. And I'd really like to to switch to uh, having, you know, I don't know whether it's a VPS somewhere or you know, if I get a uh, rack mount server in a, in a data center somewhere. But I think ZFS is why I have the ZFS uh, icon up here is a great. Um, Great tool for being able to do uh, snapshots and backups and replication very quickly. Um, so, 
I'm going to move on. I got kind of derailed there with all the microphone stuff. So, uh, so yeah, but uh, you'll also, you know, might have some servers here uh, that you're going to run yourself again or um, if you're going to do anything on your own, right? So that's why there's the question mark rate infrastructure. I, I don't know. Do you need to run your own or are you going to, you're going to pay somebody else to run it for you? Um, both are valid options and you can, you know, easily run the same software, whether it's something you're running or, or whether you're hosting it uh, in a VPS or, or having specific applications hosted. Um, so, you know, uh, Linux server, you might want to use KVM uh, to, to host a virtual machine of something. Um, obviously, containerization, I've used a ton in, in my career. Uh, you can use, you know, Podman, Docker. Um, most of the applications on the server side that you're going to spin up are going to have uh, one of those, uh, like, they'll either have a pre-made container or pre-made VM that you can spin up uh, without a whole lot of, uh, you know, hassle to doing it, uh, it gets you started quickly. All right, so does it matter, right? Does, does using open source software on, you know, for your business on your systems matter? Like, what do you, what do you think? Yes, I mean, I think it matters. I'm in here, I'm talking about it, so I think it matters. Then would you wanna tell me why you think it matters? Because I don't wanna use Microsoft. Okay, I don't wanna use Microsoft, that's, that's one reason, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> could you have choice? Let's, let's call that because you have choice. You can choose not to use Microsoft. You can choose not to use the stuff with, uh, with AI uh, uh, baked in. So I have, uh, you know, so I have this picture of trees up here to remind me. Sustainability, right, is sort of a reason for me. Um, uh, and, and I, you know, I mean that from a from a business perspective, right? If I build my my business on open source, I'm not at the whim of whatever company uh, is is making the software, right? It's a community based thing. We talk, you know, and we all know that you can fork it or you can pay developers. If, you know, if you if you get successful, right, you can pay developers to develop things in house and hopefully still right open that code and continue to contribute. But you're not beholden to another company um, that can pull the rug out like my VPN example earlier and, and those sorts of things. So, so, you know, sort of back to the business side of things. So like why start a business at all, right? You might, you might say. So, um, and I think it ties into a lot of those same uh, like aspects of freedom and choice, right? Um, when you, you know, work for, so, so I, let me like scoot a little ahead and go, go to my journey, right? So, um, you know, I was working for a company for almost nine years, and one day they decided, hey, uh, we need to downsize, you know, financial reasons, laid off 20% of the workforce, and boom, you know, I'm, I'm not working for that company anymore, right? And you suddenly realize how much of your identity is tied to the company you work for, and in our country, right, the healthcare is tied to the company, and all those sorts of things, and I go, well, like, wait a minute, like, you know, I kind of felt like just like uh, when a vendor pulls the rug out from you, you're like, hey, we're not, we're not going to make this software anymore. I'm like, oh, we're not going to give you your job anymore. And it was kind of a, a wake-up call. And building a business to me is sort of the, you know, it's like to call it a DIY mindset, right? Like, or, you know, but it's in that same uh, vein as open source of, of you owning your own destiny and, and building your own thing and being able to, um, do it how you want to do it, right? You know, we t I had up there earlier uh, maximum technical liberty, right? And I'm like, this is like maximum business liberty, right? Um, and it, it, it's it's hard, right? That's what I started with, right? Building a business is hard, um, but you know, it's it's worth it to have those sort of freedoms that we have, uh, like like with open source software. Um, Right. So for me, um, I'm only at the sort of the beginning of this journey. I thought it'd be a lot further along in my journey right now. Uh, the journey like looked looked pretty short to start, and then you realize how long of a journey it is. But uh, it's a journey, and I, I am where I am, and it's it's great, and I, I'm uh, excited to be here, being able to, to talk to you about about my journey and some of the things I've learned. Um, so, so yeah, so. So a takeaway, uh, right, so I haven't talked, I mean, I talked a little bit about technology, but I wanna say spend less time on the technology. If you're, if you're starting a business or you're helping somebody start a business, you're, you're working in early stages of a business, um, even if you're in later stages of a business, um, don't get too 
too wrapped up, right? As technical people, which I'm assuming most of us are, you, you tend to get like really wrapped up in that tech and you get really down in the weeds with your technical project. And you wanna build like the best thing you can possibly build. And a lot of times you start there, mistakes I've made with this current you know, iteration of things. Like you start there and you're building this thing and you're like just, I, if I just get all of the technology right and if I just build these, this vision I have, right, then it's gonna be great and I'm gonna like make a bajillion dollars because it's, it's gonna be the best thing ever. But really, um, you need, customers, right? You need people who want to buy the thing. Um, and so I put up here in the, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of design thinking. It's like a, a you know, framework for, uh, it's, it's like a lot like agile software development. If you don't, if you don't know much about design thinking, look it up, right? But it's, it's you really want to involve the customer early is the thought there. Um, so that's why, you know, so sharing your ideas early with the customer, getting customer feedback um, before you go building all this technology in open source, right? You don't need uh, a whole bunch of servers to do a whole bunch of I don't know, whatever you're planning on doing if nobody's going to buy the thing, right? Or if, if you're, you know, so, um, and that's my, my other recommendation, right, is, is coming up with the most simple prototype. Now, it can be a technical solution. You can actually, like, build a simple website or, you know, build a simple application or something, but simple is the key here. Uh, I mean, sticky, like, the, the guy, you know, the guy I worked with who was, like, the design thinking person literally ran us through, you know, something, sticky notes on a wall, right? <laughs> like, and was like, this can be a prototype. Like, you run this by a couple of customers, right? Because if, if you're getting, like, blank stares or, or something early on in the process, um, it's time to bail. You, know, <laughs> you don't wanna, you don't wanna go building all that technology for something that might not ever take off. Uh, so uh, I wanna really, you know, like hit that point home. Uh, it's the less technical aspect of, of this talk, but it's probably the most important one. Um, which leads me to, right, this, the, this next slide, right? So starting a business, like really high risk, uh, but can be really high reward, um, so. It's and it, you know it's it's awesome, but uh, I see using open source in your business right as can also have like almost as high like has that really high reward, but there's a lot less risk right, and I actually think it can reduce the risk overall in your business. Not like not only is it a less risky proposition to use it, but it can actually reduce risk in some ways. Um, you know, again, all of the things you know I've mentioned and, and the reasons you know for you know using and loving open source. Um, it just gives you that those platforms that you know can't be taken from you, or even if they are, you know, projects, you know, sometimes uh, fade. Let's call it in, in open source, but um, but if it's important to you and your business, right, you you've got to have the the ability to to go out there and either either hire a developer, or bring it in house, do it yourself. Um, but you have those options. Whereas if you know you're already using especially like a SaaS service, and they're just like, yeah, we're not going to do this anymore, or like you know a Google product, they're like, yeah, this is the one we're going to kill this week. Um, so uh, you know it, it can reduce that risk for you uh, as as well as be really rewarding um, for all of the the you know open source ethos sort of reasons uh, we have. So yeah, so so right at the beginning I said, oh, don't do it. Building a business is hard, but open source for your business is easy, right? So that, that's the the really the takeaway point I want here is that the technology is the easy part. You can, all right, uh, if you, if you're here, if you're at Self, you've probably used Linux. You probably use a bunch of different open source software. Again, you probably have half the stuff I put on the slides installed on your system, or you used it. You're at least familiar with it. So the technology is all the easy part, right? The building the business is the hard part. Don't worry about the technology. Worry about the business, worry about your idea, that sort of thing first. Um, so, wrapping up a little early. Uh, I think I must have missed something with all of the <laughs> technology fails here, but if you have any questions or feedback, I got time for that. But somebody has the mic and somebody needs to use. Oh, there we go, mic guy. I, I just, I just want to say uh, I started attending the Nashville Linux users group in 2013, 2018, the president of that Linux group helped us get started, saved us over $200,000 so far, open source. Yeah. I'm out of Microsoft penitentiary. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to have you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for uh, giving us a great talk. Uh, you mentioned you have a storage array, right? And the reason, one of the reasons I really like open source 
is access to open data standards and owning my data, right? So I'm not locked in. Uh, how important do you, you know, think that is? And was that a consideration in, in your decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's one of those things that I forgot to mention. <laughs> um, but yeah, having open, and, and a lot of, it's not just the uh, data being open, it's, it's the formats being open as well, right? So, you know, with like LibreOffice and some, a lot, most of the other applications I, I put up there, right? So even if the application disappears, it, it's usually pretty easy to get your data out of it, right? Most open source stuff makes it easy to be interoperable with other systems, uh, has you know good import and export uh, options, and even if it doesn't, right, which I think is rare, you can see the source, well, first of all, you have the application as is, so you can probably still get it out, right? And um, worst case, you can see the source code, you can figure out how the data, I mean, maybe it's a little, uh, it's beyond me to like go look at the source code, right? And think, but somebody can look at the source code and figure out how the data structures are put together and you can reverse engineer that and still get your data out. Um, whereas with the proprietary software, it's a, yeah, it's a black box, it's a format that you might not know and if that, you know, I don't know, good, good luck like trying to open a word perfect file or something, you know, nowadays, right? So. I mean, you might be able to do it, but it's probably with open source software. I was going to say one of the things that I use every single day is new cash. If you've okay. ever heard yep. about that one, it's accounting software. And one of the things about it nowadays is that, you know, even if you were trying to limp along with a 15-year-old version of Quicken or something like that, now they've offlined all that and restricted things, and everybody's trying to move to this paying into it a monthly fee for whatever. So just that thing that, I mean, you just can't keep using that stuff. And so I think you pointed out in a couple other areas, but if nobody's ever tried that and you're looking for something for financial related stuff, uh, it's free and open source, it works well. I mean, it's a little bit of a learning curve, but hey. What's it called? GNU Cash. And it has business? I mean, I always thought it was a personal finance, but it's... No, I print out invoices for my customers from it and everything. Yeah, it's 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 like like he said like Quicken or whatever. It's like the the lower lower tier, but still a business accounting software stuff. I, I am familiar with it. Uh, I'm still at the spreadsheet stage right now, so we're, you know we're okay. Uh, as software as a service becomes more ubiquitous, especially in the uh, business space, I mean, do you think there's gonna be a point where the FOSS and similar solutions become the only thing that isn't offered as SaaS? Yeah, <laughs> I, th I think we're quickly moving in that direction. I mean. No, you're, you're not crazy. Uh, I, I think that's, yeah. I, I mean, I think, so if you look at it, right, like even the open source solutions, uh, a lot of uh, the companies are structuring around, I don't want to call it SaaS, but they have, they have that sort of monthly, uh, pay a monthly fee offering, right? And so you, got, you have to cover your server costs and that sort of thing somehow. Um, and, it, and, it, and it kind of makes sense. So if you've ever run a business, like monthly recurring revenue is like, it's really good. Like it's what you want. So... I totally understand it both from the open source projects where like, yeah, we're going to adopt this commercial model because it works. Um, and, I, and I understand why the commercial platforms are doing it. But the, yeah, the challenge is with the commercial platforms is you don't have another option. And with the open source options, like, yeah, you can either, again, self-host it or you can pay somebody else to host it. And you have those options. And again, like options is like <laughs> freedom, right, is one of the, the big reasons for using all this stuff. Uh, I didn't get an idea yet from your talk whether you've had whether you've had to face training other people on productivity apps that are that happen to be FOSS. I can imagine a conversation now that you work here. Let me train you on how to use ABC. This is how we do it here. But have you thought about um, or do you reason about productivity apps differently because of the friction that they might introduce if someone's already familiar with something that's more industry standard? So yes, from a couple, a couple of, uh, uh, in a couple of ways, right? So one is that, so so there is, so there can be a, so if you're trying to, you already have a business that's running on proprietary software, and you're trying to bring open source software in, like switch it out, right? That's probably your most complicated scenario, and yeah, you're going to absolutely need to do user training there. Um, and I mean, there's tons of you know uh, resources out there for people who've done it more or a lot less successfully, um, you know. But basically, kind of taking baby steps and, and doing a transition if you're gonna gonna go in that um, respect. Um, so yeah, it can be a challenge, right? And there's certainly cost involved there, right? And so that's the other thing is, 
that's, that's one of the considerations um, where people will push back against open source and say, well, it's not really saving me anything. It's going to spend all this money on training and you know, all that kind of things. And you have to say, okay, well, yes, we do need to spend some money up front on training. Um, and yes, it's going to cost X dollars. But I mean, when you compare the numbers, uh, I think it's usually a spurious argument, right? Because you're going to save the money on the cost of the software the, the commercial software that you're not paying, um, and then you're going to say so you're going to spend some upfront money on the switch and some upfront money on training, but it's not as uh, as much of a long tail as you think because once because there's already when you get into a company right there's already tons of like esoteric software <laughs> that companies use. It's not ju it's not just Microsoft Word and all this other stuff. There's you get in a company and it's like oh here's this or this homegrown application that we have internally right. So every company has those things, and so once the you know you come into the company, and that's what you do. It's just like part of the onboarding process, right? You're like, okay, we'll come in. We use LibreOffice instead of Microsoft Word. You know, it might take you a little bit more uh, time to get up to speed, but once you've done that initial training, or whatever, if you started off with that, right? It's just people learn it as they come in, and it's not as as big of a lift as you'd think, right? Um, and I know this from experience. Like I worked for a company for eight and a half years. We switched to a bunch of open source software, and and that was kind of it. it's like at first everyone was like, oh, I don't know, and then you know after a while it just becomes it's what you use. New people get hired, and that's then you know it's again it's part of the onboarding. It might take you a little bit longer, but not compared to you know other things. So and. Somebody else had started to talk. Oh. I know you said you kind of retired from the big company perspective and you went independent, but how would you approach a C-suite that might be gearing towards Microsoft with that argument? Um, as we know, people fear change. What would be maybe an amicable way of approaching that? Um, so. I'm going to go back, well, you know, I'm not, I could go back a couple of slides. I'm not going to mess with the slides, but um, it's, so where I showed on the slides of like the cost and the uh, um, vendor lock-in piece, right? So I, I would, I would, you know, those are the, the two pieces that I think you can sell a C-suite on, right? You can say, look, over time, so, so let's, let, and let me give an example of this one specifically. Uh, with Nextcloud, right? So like over time, right? So right now we're spending, I don't know what, like it's like $15 a user if you're using Google or Microsoft. Is that, that, that seems about right to everybody, right? So I think it's $15 per license per user, right? And you get the, you get the whole suite, right? Um, that adds up really quick, right? That's, a, you know, you get to 10 users, it's $150 a month and you know, you're a bigger company than that. It's, it's a huge chunk of change every single month. Um, and, and by the way, they don't always not make big updates that users have to relearn <laughs> to the earlier point as well. Um, but then, so you have that, that huge monthly fee and so you go with something like Nextcloud and you say like, look, we can pay a tenth of this or maybe, maybe it's half, I don't know, you know, but you, know, you, you get the server and you have to have enough you know, of iron to run <laughs> whatever, uh, you know, number of users and support it well and make sure it's not, you know, laggy and, and slow and all those kinds of things. Um, but it's scale, it's it's not like a linear, like per user, you know, it's just a, a new fee for every user. You, you know, you're probably gonna get, you know, it depends on how big your server already is, but you're gonna be able to like double the number of users before you, you know, even think about doubling the cost, right? So, um, and, and you're not gonna have to, like in a small business sense, right? You, you may, like you have one user, you might actually spend less going with one of those services. But once you start to get to like that five user point or something, all of a sudden you're, you've tipped over into like, wait a minute, like I can run this on a $20 a month VPS and probably get up to like 20, 30 users on here, or I can pay $75 for five users, wait, like it becomes a no brainer really. And that's every month you're paying that, right? So. I mean, you, like how much training are you going to possibly spend to bring people over to this new software, right, where that doesn't make sense after, you know, just a few months? Crunch just crunch the numbers, yes. So, yes, show them the, so sorry, that was a really long one, it's like, show them the numbers, and if that's not convincing enough, and say, well, and we're not locked into this vendor, and, you know, you can use examples, there's famous, I have my own personal examples, but there's, you know, examples you can find out there um, of, of big, you know, companies having uh, that sort of thing happen to them, so. Google rug pull. I mean, it's happened on so many applications. <laughs> so. what, what are your
your opinions about moving people off of windows? That's a lot trickier. <laughs> I mean, well, so it's not not these days, uh, honestly. So, <sighs> why? Um, yeah, no. So, yeah, it's a topic of the day. So I can tell you uh, from also from experience, right? So, we I worked for a training company before. Uh, we did a lot of technical training and. We made all our lab environments on Linux. Well, I moved all of our lab environments over to Linux when I, when I was the manager, right? So, um, and, and that was uh, before COVID, that was, you know, desktops in the, the physical lab machines. All of those were, were running um, Linux, uh, which was just, I mean, I can't even tell you how much better that was from a systems administration standpoint, but we're not going to go in there. So what about switching users? So those were students, right? They were coming in, they had to use what we had for our lab environments. Um, and. And in a lot of cases, it didn't matter, right? It was, it's like an implementation detail. They, they needed a browser, they needed a terminal, which, well, that was better experience on, on, uh, on Linux than on Windows, right? Because they're maybe they're doing Python programming or, or something like that, right? Or, or you know, C programming. Um, and, and they needed like a, a text editor, right? And, even, and now, you can even get, you know, some of the proprietary text editors, like, I mean, I'll mention it, right? VS Code runs fine on Linux now, and like, that's what most people would be like the default, you know, uh, and, and maybe that's Microsoft trying to steal people back the other way, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's doable. Um, I think doing it in an office setting is hard. I think, you know, so how I would do it if I were going to do it is like, I wouldn't just like switch people out, right? Like I would, I would say like, Every time you got a new laptop, like you're onboarding a new employee or you're, uh, you know, like, oh, your laptop's up for renewal, like, that's when I would just, like, switch it out on them. Like, you know, and when you have to prepare, like, it's all the applications on top that matter more, right? So if they're, like, heavy Microsoft Office users and they need the features that are in the desktop version of Office that aren't yet in the cloud, and I say yet because I, I think it's all going to move there eventually uh, into 365, that's the kind of stuff you have to get them off first. Um, so... want to comment the we have five employees including me uh, one user is 81 years old she never touched a computer until she's 60 uh, I got her off Windows 7 skipped Windows 10 got her onto Linux she was up and running in 90 seconds and now she only does everything on uh, a browser so that part was easier right but uh, we have one application, Lotus Approach. It's the access uh, equivalent under Lotus. Okay. Uh, that's our last Windows app I'm trying to get rid of. Uh, but she was up and running in 90 seconds. Okay. She hated computers before. She still hates computers. That's not going to change. It didn't change it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, the other user is 85 now. I got him running up, up and running in 60 seconds. Yeah. So, uh, I just wanted to say that. So yeah, be brave, do it. <laughs> Anyone else? The, the light's starting to blink here, so we probably have time for like one more question. Not so much of a question, but uh, on the topic of Windows, if you have you know uh, employees or whoever who can't really make the jump for whatever reason, you need this piece of software or whatever, um, Windows 10 IoT, LTSC, it's supported until 2033, I think. Um, it's basically Windows 10, Windows 7 edition. So it's, it's completely stripped down, as close to good as Windows can get. That's also an option. Yeah, and, and don't forget WSL, right? That can be, especially if you're in uh, you know, a place where you're trying to shift like a developer type rollover. You say like, ah, oh, here, use, you know, start using these tools in this, in this uh, uh, you know, framework. Uh, I don't. I don't know what you want to. How you want to say it, but you know, don't call it a virtual machine because you'll just be like, well, what? It's not. So, um, but, uh, but if you, if you start getting them used to the tools that way. So again, it, and it, that goes back to what I said before, right? Getting used to the tools first. And most of the tools are in a web, web browser now, which, love it or hate it, it's actually really good for getting people, <laughs> you know, onto onto Linux. So because. Uh, yeah, I mean, I even had my wife running Linux for a while. Um, and I think the only reason she's back on Windows is because it came on her laptop, and I'm like, ah, uh, I didn't get a chance to like wipe it before she uh, she started using it. So, um, yeah, no. All right, I think we're about out of time. So, thank you all.
have one minute left.